Hello, my name is David Scher. I'm here to uh, for another session in Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. We're just going to get started on the semester, and uh, we're working with you. Uh, today, we're going to talk about atomic structure and radioactivity. So this is the beginning of some, of some discussion about radiation physics. That's sort of the bedrock. The radiation safety is uh, rests upon. Uh, in our program at Illinois Tech, you will all take or have taken uh, a, an entire semester course on radiation physics. And so I'm going to only touch on a few of the items that are included in that course uh, to sort of set the, the framework for this course. Um, it's important that you develop uh, a strong foundation in radiation physics to be able to be a competent health physicist. Uh, and this is just going to be a, a little overview or a little uh, reminder if you've taken that course already. So the first thing to recall is that about the turn of the 20th century, so around 1900 or so, people began, 1910, people began to understand that atoms were organized into atoms, and the thing that they learned, atoms are arranged into a particular structure with a dense, small, heavy nucleus surrounded by the electrons that give rise to electric current, electric forces, um, that those electrons are arranged in a definite order, arranged into orbitals or shells. Uh, and uh, there are suborbitals within the, the, each of the shells. So the most tightly bound shell has atomic number, principal atomic number equal one, uh, this is called the K-shell. The next most tightly bound shell is uh, quantum number N equal 2. It has two subshells in it that are based on different uh, angular momentum. Uh, then there's an N equal 3 shell. That's a KLM shell with uh, three subshells. The uh, next is the uh, N shell with suborbitals inside it. The Further out you go from the nucleus, the more suborbitals are, are within each shell, the more electrons are within each shell. Okay. Um, for our purposes in radiation science, one of the important properties of this is that when an electron in one of the shells is, when there's a vacancy in one of the shells, an electrons removed, then electrons from the outer shells can fall into that, uh, that vacancy it be more tightly bound to the uh, nucleus. So these electrons have negative electrical force. The nuclear, uh, nucleus has a positive electrical force. And so they're more tightly bound because they're more closely attracted by the nucleus and the electrical force there. Um, when they move one shell with a definite energy to another shell with a definite energy, there's a very fixed difference in the energies. And so that energy that uh, uh, that is that, where the electrons being more pulled into a tighter energy shell, it needs to give up free energy, and it does that usually in the form of a photon. Photon has a characteristic energy, a very specific energy that's equal to the difference in the two energy shells. Um, said that um, the shells are K, L, M, N, O, P, etc. Transitions from the L shell to the K shell give rise to photons that are called the K alpha lines. From the K shell, K beta lines. From the N shell, the K alpha lines, etc. Now, as I noted, there are suborbitals within each shell, and so there are slightly different energy levels for each of those suborbitals. That gives rise to uh, the, uh, a wider variety of lines that we'll describe in a minute. First, I want to mention 
that all these transitions are primarily uh, uh, all these transitions primarily give rise to photons or characteristic energies. Now, photons are, are particles of light. They uh, have they're parameterized by wavelength or with energy, and we'll talk about the relationship between those. Long late wavelength photons are low energy, like radio waves or microwaves. Short wavelength photons are uh, high energy, like X-rays or gamma rays. Um, uh, uh, photons up from about 400 to 700 nanometers are visible light. Uh, they're about three electron volts or so in energy. Um, let's see. So the point is that, that these transitions can give rise to a wide variety of, of uh, types of lights, some visible, some microwaves, some uh, uh, x-rays. Um, this is a radiation safety class, so one of our concerns is going to be with, with the x-rays that are the elements when there's these kind of transitions. Uh, so, as I said, there, within the, the L-shell there are suborbitals. Each of these are very slightly different. So if you look very carefully at the uh, K-alpha line, which is for L-shell to K-shell, you'll find that there are uh, a fine structure that represents two lines that are very uh, overlapped. Then the K-beta are from the M-shell to the K-shell. There are multiple lines in that as well. Then there are the um, L lines, that is for electrons flying into the L shell. Uh, and so the transitions, the relationship between the, the lines that, that in the sigma notation and the <clears throat> different suborbitals are shown here. In this uh, convention, first letter is the shell that the electrons are falling into. <clears throat> the second letter is the shell that the electrons are originating from. And in each case, there's a, a definite energy difference. Um, and for many purposes, it's sufficient to say that the, the alpha lines are treated as a single line, the beta lines are treated as a single line, etc. Now, <clears throat> so when we need to use physical data, it's important to have uh, reliable and credible sources for that data. So in the case of these uh, electron transitions, we can go to a, a very reputable source, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. It's a government agency. It's a premier agency in the world for uh, 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 met metrology, for measurement standards, including radiation measurement standards. NIST hosts a database that, that gives <clears throat> gives us all the information about transitions, uh, X-ray transitions uh, for many elements. So in this case, uh, we're going to select an element. Oh, we're going to select molybdenum in this database, and then we're going to we have the option of choosing particular transitions, or we're going to we can ask for it to return all the transitions. So we're going to have to look at all transitions for molybdenum, and we click the button to get transitions. The data shows us all the different kinds of transitions that are possible and all the energies that are uh, present for uh, these transitions. These transitions. Okay, so that's what we got. Uh, notice that here it also tells us the transition and the, the sigma notation for the different lines. Okay, so we're, we can use this information. Uh, so these, these energies of these lines between uh, re represent the energy difference between shells. They're characteristic of the particular element, of the particular uh, uh, chemical element with atomic number 42, molybdenum. These are the direct column is a uh, particular energy that has been observed in experiments. The theoretical line are calculated by complicated calculations, but the, the measured lines are shown in the directly observed category. Okay, so um, we chose molybdenum. 
This is a, a diagram of the energy spectrum of the molybdenum X-ray uh, peak or X-ray spectrum from from molybdenum. Uh, the K alpha lines all, as I said, blend together. K alpha line, the K beta line, etc. Uh, so with 35 keV electrons uh, inserted in on the target, this is the spectrum you see. Now, the uh, ions that are in this spectrum down at the bottom are from a different source that we'll talk about in the next lecture. <clears throat> Transitions that we're talking about. Um, it's called Bremsstrahl, and we'll, like I said, we'll discuss it next time. Um, so notice that these wavelengths are reported in nanometers. And in our table of, uh, our, our diagram of uh, electro, uh, photons, we talked about wavelengths in terms of distance too. And then we related it to different energies. Well, here's the relationship between wavelength and energy. So the energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the uh, light, or the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So the energy is related to the wavelength. E is equal to HC, Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Planck's constant has a value of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Um, the uh, standard SI units for the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And uh, we measure frequency in hertz or per second. We measure wavelengths in meters. Those are all the standard SI units. We're going to make some, some transformations in a moment here and see how things work. Now, given that E is equal to HC over lambda, I can take that uh, relationship and reverse it to find the wavelength as HC over E. It's just simply uh, doing a little bit of uh, algebra. Now we're going to convert some units. We, we looked up the table of energies. They were in uh, electron volts. So we need to, to, to use SI units. We need to convert them into joules. So the uh, K alpha energy was K alpha 1 energy was 17.479 keV. One joule is equal to 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electron volts. This is a notation we'll be using throughout the year. 6.24 times 10 to the 18th means it's 6, 2, 4, and then 17 more digits, or uh, 15 more digits, 16 more digits. So um, it's, it's a total of uh, 18 digits following the first number. The convention is you only have one number before the decimal point, and then whatever the, the remaining uh, multiples is it, it are held in the R10. Another notation that's equivalent to that, that came about during the computer age because you couldn't write things with subscripts, superscripts uh, early on, it was this E notation, 6.24 times E18 means times 10 to the 18th electron volts. That's one joule. Okay. Um, so we had 17 and a half keV, uh, which is, this is not the, the scientific notation. So we put in the scientific notation, it's 1.75 E4 EV. That's the same as this many keV three orders of magnitude for the K, and then one more to move the decimal point. Then we divide by the conversion factor from EVs to joules, and that tells us we have a total of 2.8 times 10 to the minus 15 joules in the, the first uh, K alpha one line. In the K beta one line, it was 17.6 KEV. That's, excuse me, 19.6 KEV. 1.96 e to the fourth EV, same thing in scientific notation. We divide by our conversion factor. Why are we dividing by the conversion factor? Well, that way the electron volts cancel out since this joule is in the denominator and it's on the bottom of the denominator, it becomes uh, on the numerator. 
and 3.14 times 10 to the minus 15 joules. That's what the energy for the uh, K beta 1 line was. Now, now we can use our formula, lambda is equal to HC over E, to find out what the wavelengths are. So, um, this was our value of H, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. C, 3.8 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now we divide by the energy we just figured out, and we, so this is, the, the joules cancel out, the seconds cancel out, we get 7.1 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Well, 10 to the minus 9 meters is a, a nanometer, so we need to move the decimal point two more times. It's, it's 0 0.071 nanometers. Okay. The wavelength for the K beta line, same math entirely, with a dip, just a different value of E in it. We take the E from there. We, we do all the math, turn the, note, the crank. We get 7.1 times 10 to the minus 11. No, this is one. 6 times 10 to the minus 11. So I'll have to make a correction in the slide. We turn the crank. We get a number that's 0 0.063, 6 6.3 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. I apologize for that typo. Okay, so let's look at our... Uh, our uh, spectrum again, the K alpha line should what should says it should be 0.71, and it turns out yeah that's about 0.71. So our calculation and our diagram work out pretty well. Uh, the K beta 0.63, and the line looks like it's about 0.63. So again, our calculations match up with the diagram pretty nicely. Now I'm going to show you a different technique that is sometimes used, sometimes taught in, in uh, chemistry and physics classes to help keep track of the units. It's very important that the units match up so that uh, we, are, we are sure we're, we're using the right computations. It's very easy to flip some of these uh, conversion factors and then it messes up the entire calculation. So for an accounting purpose, we can write down our value um, we're going to calculate HC, and then we're going to convert units into units that are more that are easier to use uh, in uh, electron volts and nanometers. Okay, um, so uh, what we do is we create a grid with little lines dividing each of the units. We write down we're calculating HC. We write down H, and we write down C. Just like we used before at 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 and 3 times 10 to the 8 units. It's joules time seconds. All the units are on the top. Here it's meters per second, so the seconds go on the bottom. Now let's do our conversions. We said before that 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electron volts is 1 joule. 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electron volts is 1 by one. Um, we're not interested in EV, so we have a thousand EV, 10 to the third EV, is KEV, that we get to the units of KEV. We have meters per second. We're interested in nanometers, so it's 10 to the ninth nanometers per meter. Now we can check our units and cross them off if they match. The joules divided by joules are canceled. The seconds divided by seconds cancel. Electron volts divided by electron volts cancel, so we cross them off. Meters divided by meters cancel. So what we're left with in terms of units is KEV nanometers. That's what we wanted to get. This is what it should be. So now to do our calculation, we just, because we have it in scientific notation, we take these coefficients and multiply them together, 6.63 times 6.24, times 1, times 3, times 1. Multiply all those out, and I get 124. 6 times 6 is 36, times 3, yep, about 124. Okay, um, then for the powers of 10, we simply add those numbers that are exponents. That's a minus 34, that's a plus 18, that's a minus 3, because it's 3 that's in the denominator, so I take away 3. 
plus 8 and then plus 9. If I add up all of those exponents, I get a minus 2. So our answer is 124 times 10 to the minus 2. To uh, is to have only one decimal point. Take these two, move the decimal point over twice, and I get 1.24 is my answer. So the answer is 1.24 keV, that's the units that are left, nanometers. This is a nice technique that's useful for lots of calculations to make sure you're having your conversion uh, factors in the right order, the right thing on the top, the right thing on the bottom, and that everything comes out with the right units. This kind of dimensional analysis will save you in many errors in your calculations. If you get the units right, most of the time your calculation will be correct. Okay. Um, so, um, this is again the same thing we did there to, to calculate these coefficients. We have, we, we multiply the coefficients as I did, we add the exponents, and we get the answer. Uh, and um, so that's what our answers were. Um, so, we came up, oh, that was, this was just calculating what HC is. I'm sorry. Now, so HC is 12.4 keV angstroms. Now, our wavelength, and, and then our wavelength is HC over E. Again, is in our first calculation, the E, the first E uh, is, um, where is the lamp, the energy 17.479. 17.479 keV. Uh, I got HC is 1.24 keV nanometers divided by 17.449. Multiply, divide those out, and I get 0.71 keV uh, uh, nanometers. The keVs cancel out. This one's on the top. This one's on the bottom. All the other uh, line we looked at, the K beta line, was 19.6 keV. So the wavelength, the, 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 what the wavelength is, we take 1.24, which is HC, that's keV nanometers, divide by the energy in keV, divide those out, I get 0 0.063 nanometers. These numbers are the same. So by creating a new set of units for my conversion factor, it makes the calculations much simpler. So Easy to remember that HC is 1.24 keV angstroms, um, keV nanometers. Okay, now I said before that the, the, the transitions between lines usually give rise to a photon. It's also possible in some cases that the photon doesn't, isn't emitted from the atom, but instead the photon transfers its energy to another electron, electron carries the, the energy away. These are called Auger electrons. It looks like Auger. It's a French name. It's pronounced Auger. Um, instead of uh, electrons being emitted, the, these electrons are emitted with a characteristic energy. It is the energy, the energy of the Auger electron is the energy of the transition minus the binding energy of the third electron. So it's the energy that it's falling into minus the energy it came from minus the binding energy of the third electron. That would be the energy of the Auger electron. Okay, um, and, and Auger electrons can be used for spectroscopy to find out about particular uh, nuclides as well. But in our case, Auger electrons would be important for calculating uh, radiation exposure so we don't overlook the Auger process. Okay, so we talked so far about the electrons, the electron clouds, and that they're bound to the nucleus. The nucleus itself also has forces inside it holding it together. That's why it's very dense. That's why it's very um, uh, compact and very small, is because there are forces that pull it together. Now, in the nucleus, we have a complication because we have the, the uh, the nuclear force is mediated by mesons that are uh, 
because of uh, exchange of quarks between different uh, ions, uh, neutrons and protons. Uh, that's what gives rise to the nuclear force, the strong nuclear force. However, the protons that are in the nucleus have like electrical charges. They're being pushed apart. So like charges repel. They're being pushed apart because of the, the electrical force between them. And so as we get more and more protons in the nucleus, we, uh, we need to add even more neutrons to have the attractive strong force overcome the electrostatic repulsion. Um, now, the neutrons and protons in a nucleus can be arranged in many ways. And um, the chemical properties, the number of electrons, is based only on the number of protons. It's the, for each positive proton in the nucleus, there's a, it's matched with an electron in the outer shells, the electron cloud, and the number of electrons in the electron cloud is what gives the chemical properties. If we add a nucleus, it doesn't change the electrical composition, it just changes the nuclear force in the, the nucleus. Um, so this means that we could have multiple types of, uh, this has uh, atomic number one, one electron, this is hydrogen. We have multiple types of hydrogen. Hydrogen one, two, and three. The traditional names of hydrogen, deuterium, tritium. So uh, these are parametrized by the, the, the different uh, kinds of materials are parametrized by several things. The atomic number is the number of protons, and it is a, a, a neutral element that's the same as the number of electrons. The atomic mass is related to uh, the number of nucleons. Uh, so the atomic mass number is the total number of the neutrons. In this case, the mass number is three. Here, the mass number is two. Here, the mass number is one. There's only one nucleon there. The neutron number, number of neutrons, is equal to the mass number minus the atomic number. So I have the total number of nucleons minus the number of protons. That gives us the neutron number. Then we can uh, identify these different uh, uh, species as uh, based on the um, atomic number and the um, the uh, proton number, the, the, the atomic number. So we write them in the form of the, the mass number and then the, the uh, symbol for the, the element. So P32 can, is, is, it's either the element dash the, the, the mass number or mass number in an exponent uh, superscript before the notice that the chemical name and the mass number are the same information each chemical name each chemical element is uh, identified by the, the the atomic number the uh, z the number so when we talk about different species there's a terminology we should know elements that have the same z are called isotopes. They're all the same chemical element. These are all the element. These are the isotopes of hydrogen. They're the same C. Uh, different uh, different uh, nuclides. In each of these different entities is a nuclide. All the ice, the collection of, of uh, nuclides that have the same neutron number are called isotomes. So um, hydrogen three and uh, Helium would be isotones. They have the same number of neutrons. Helium has two protons and two neutrons. Since it has the same uh, number of neutrons, they would be isotones. Isobars have the same mass number. Everything with mass number three would be an isobar with tritium. Uh, so um, the other thing to, to note is there are isomers. So within each nucleus, there is there are energy levels that are in the nucleus that are very similar or analogous to the energy levels that are in the electron cloud. Uh, and so um, if one of these, if the nuclei, if the, a nucleus becomes excited in an, in an excited state, it's an isomer of the same element. It's just an excited state of it. Okay. Now, um, we talked about atomic mass. So we're going to talk about a unit for atomic mass. Um, the atomic mass unit is is uh, help convenient for measuring uh, 
the masses of nuclei, nuclei, nuclei and nucleons. Okay, so uh, the, the atomic mass unit is defined in terms of the mass of one, one mole of carbon-12 has uh, 12 grams, and it's also uh, one, um, the nucleus of carbon-12 measures 12 AMU. So the mass of one mole of carbon-12 is 12 grams, and one, one, one nucleus is uh, um, 12 atomic mass units. So let's figure out what, what it is in terms of grams. One AMU is 12 grams per mole, right? And times one mole has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, Avogadro's number of atoms in one mole. And then there's each atom has 12 AMU, because carbon 12 grams of carbon uh, 12 in a mole, and each atom has 12 AMU. So if I multiply all this out, I end up with 66 times 10 to the minus 24 grams is the mass in one atomic mass unit. Let's see what that is in terms of energy. We know the equation E equal mc squared correlates the equivalent energy to mass. So 1 AMU, if we multiply this times C that we had before, is 1.49 10 to the minus 18 joules. Or we can use the, uh, the joules to electron volts uh, conversion we had to go. And we find that 1 AMU is 931.5 MeV. Okay. So 1 AMU is 931, uh, 935, uh, 31.5 MeV. But when we measure the mass of a proton, of a free proton, we find out it's 1.007276 AMU. It's 937.8. And the mass of the neutron is slightly larger, 1.008665 AMU, 939.6 MeV. <clears throat> well, there are 12 nucleons in carbon-12, but when we add up 12 protons and 12 neutrons, it's going to be different from those 12 nucleons. A nucleon, by the way, sorry if I'm using jargon, uh, a nucleon is either a neutron or a proton. It's the, the thing that's in the nucleus. Um, so if we look at the mass of carbon-12, we'd said it's by definition 12 atomic mass units. If we look at the mass of 12 protons and 12 units of neutrons, that adds up to 12.0956 atomic mass units. So there's a little bit of extra mass in the free particles that's not present in the, the carbon-12 nucleus. The difference in energy because of this difference in mass is what we call the binding energy. It's called the mass defect. It's the, the mass of the nucleus, the assembled nucleus, uh, is different, the, the, is smaller than the mass of the individual parts. That defect is because of the binding energy. The forces that are holding it together uh, take up some of the energy. Uh, so in, in the case of carbon-12, we have 89 MeV of binding energy. And if we divide by 12, we find it's 7.42 MeV per nucleon is the binding mass per nucleon. Okay, so here's a chart of the binding mass per nucleon. Uh, it said carbon-12 right here was 7.42. So it's plotted on here. It's about 7.4. It's pretty good right there. Yeah, just under 7.5. And, and if we look at a, a plot of all of the nuclei that are out there, it looks something like this. Now, I want to make a few um, things, a few observations. Notice that there's these bumps up and down and up and down and up and down. That occurs because of the existence of shells. When a, a, a atomic, when elect, uh, an atom has the, the electronic shells completely filled, that's a very stable configuration. Adding one more uh, atom after that uh, takes even, uh, is, is less energetically favorable. Uh, same thing is true of the, the shells that, are, that exist in the nucleus. So helium has a very high number of uh, binding energy per nucleon, but 
uh, elements that are slightly smaller or slightly larger have less uh, binding energy per nucleon. They're not as tightly bound. Uh, same thing for carbon-12, etc., oxygen-16, uh, uh, and so on. They, they have, uh, they're, they're energetically favorable. Um, the other thing I would note is that helium has a lot of binding energy for nucleon relative to its partners. It carries away a lot of energy. Uh, helium will become one of the kinds of radiation we're going to discover because when it undergoes, to, when, when, it get, when a, a heavy element gives off helium, it gives up a lot of energy and can find a more uh, uh, favorable energy state. Uh, I would note that the, the, the atom is binding energy per nucleon, where this maximizes, is iron 56. Now, binding energy per nucleon falls off as you get to heavier elements because, um, because uh, uh, you're adding lots and lots of protons to the neutrons, and there's the repulsion. So there's less binding going on because there's a lot of force being given to repel the nucleon instead of bind them closer. Um, I would note that bismuth 209 is the last element that is uh, stable. Lead 209, actually, there, there are no elements uh, that uh, beyond this that are stable. They're, they're not bound tightly enough to be stable. Um, so we can uh, organize all of the nuclei that exist onto a table with their neutron number in one axis, their proton number in another axis. And this is called the chart of the nucle nuclides. This line that I've drawn here is where the number of neutrons is equal to the number of protons, 80, 80, etc. Notice that at very low mass, the line is, uh, there's a lot of elements, stable elements that are um, near the N equals Z line. We're, we don't have a, extra, a lot of extra protons or a very large number of protons to add to the, the uh, repulsion. So the number of neutrons, the number of protons are very close. At larger masses where there's a lot more protons, we need to have even more neutrons, more neutrons than we have protons to overcome the electrostatic repulsion. So in heavy nuclei, the number of neutrons is greater than the number of protons. In nuclei, they're approximately equal. And uh, in order to get to uh, these green boxes are stable, in order to get to stability, the nuclei undergo transitions. I'm going to show that in a minute. This is a chart of the nuclides. It's available on the web. You can see the web address. It's sponsored by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, the black boxes are stable nuclei. There are no stable nuclei heavier than lead, as I said. Um, and <clears throat> uh, this is just similar to what we saw before. It, it bends over to a higher a number of neutrons uh, at the heavier elements. There are the neutrons. Rich. Now, there's another source of information from NIST the, that I mentioned before. This shows isotopic abundances. Here's the website where you can get the information. Um, I told you there are different isotopes of the same element, hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. This tells what the, the uh, atomic masses are. This tells you how much is present in nature as uh, hydrogen or as deuterium in terms of percentage or fraction. Uh, and so um, we can find out all the different isotopes and, and these work together to give us the, um, the uh, atomic mass that you see in the periodic table. Here are the, the, the uh, slides of uranium and the different masses that they have that, that you'll find in this table as well. So, as I said, there are different nuclei, uh, different uh, isotopes of the same nucleus, um, and there's a line of stability. Uh, neutrons that are to the left of the line of stability, they don't have enough neutrons to be uh, uh, stable. Neutrons, uh, elements to the right, or nuclides to the right, are neutron rich. They have too many neutrons. And so, whether they're neutron rich or neutron deficient determines how those elements 
we'll try to get to stability. How, what are transitions allowed to go to get to stability? And here's a little chart that shows this. Nuclides that are neutron rich. So one that exists here has too many neutrons. It will move uh, toward the line of stability uh, by undergoing beta decay. The atomic, that's what beta decay, a neutron changes into a proton and gives off an electron and an electron neutrino. Neutrino. Um, and so on the chart, a, a nuclide will move toward the line of stability by moving in this direction from this to this nuclide as isotones. They have the same uh, uh, number. Neutron deficient nuclides that are on the left of the line of stability in this chart, they have several ways they can undergo, uh, move toward the line of stability. They can undergo positron decay. That's a positron is an antiparticle for electron. It's the same uh, mass. Uh, the only difference is it has a positive charge instead of an electric charge, instead of a negative charge. So it can undergo positron decay. A proton can become a neutron, move toward the line of stability. So Z will decrease, and uh, the, the number, number of protons will decrease, number of neutrons will increase. Uh, so uh, positron, a positron, a Proton becomes a neutron and gives off this beta particle and the neutrino. Another possibility. Now, in order for this to happen, there has to be enough energy to create the positron. The positron has a rest mass of uh, 511 keV, so it has to be have, have possible. If it's not possible, we can have a, a, a reaction called a, a nuclear transformation called electron capture, sometimes called K capture, because the electrons that are close to the nucleus are in the K shell. A neutron will absorb uh, an electron and emit a proton and a uh, uh, neutrino. Um, it, it, addition is the same as it is for the beta particle, the, the positron decay, uh, the beta plus decay, the neutron uh, a proton absorbs a neutron, the atomic number goes down, it increases the number. Same thing to move towards stability. Another possibility is uh, a neutron emission. And so then uh, if it's uh, neutron deficient, it can uh, uh, emit a neutron. So uh, it can move it should be neutron rich. It moves to the left and, and emits a, a, a neutron. Heavy elements undergo a different kind of transformation. They give off a he helium nucleus. I said that carries a lot of energy. It's called alpha decay. And then the other kind of decay is uh, uh, isomeric or uh, internal transition. Different energy shells that are inside the nucleus can have transitions and uh, gamma rays can be given off. Now I mentioned beta decay here, beta plus or beta minus decay. Um, they're, they're always uh, coupled with a neutrino or antineutrino. So the energy that's emitted in the decay is shared between the, the beta particle and the neutrino. And so the beta particle that we observe <clears throat> has uh, a different energy possibility. It's entirely possible that it can carry essentially all the energy away, and some beta particles, beta minus particles, can, can have no energy. They're also attracted back to the nucleus because they're negatively charged and the nucleus is positively charged. Beta plus positrons are emitted with a little bit different spectrum. Because they're positively charged, they're emitted from the nucleus they're pushed away from the nucleus because of the light charge, they're repelled, and so they have a little bit different energy. Now, the maximum energy the beta particle can carry away is if the neutrino carries very little weight. The um, maximum energy is the, the difference in energy levels for the parent nucleus and the, the daughter nucleus. Now, the average energy for these spectrum is uh, these uh, overall spectrum of beta particles is about a third of the maximum energy. So 
in some charts you will find the, the maximum energy and in some charts you'll find the, the average energy when you look up this information. So be careful that you know what you're looking at. Um, as I said, uh, beta decay has gives up, goes from one uh, nucleus that has a certain number of protons and neutrons, carbon-14, uh, six protons, eight, eight neutrons. It becomes a new, one of the protons becomes, one of the neutrons becomes a proton. So the number of neutrons decreases, number of protons increases. There's also an electron and an antineutrino given off. Beta plus is the opposite. Carbon-10, we have six protons and four neutrons to begin with. One of the protons becomes a neutron, goes back to the N equals E, the match number of neutrons and protons. Five protons means it's boron. It gives up a positron and a neutrino. Electron capture that I just mentioned before is another possibility. If, if you have too many uh, protons, the, a proton can capture an electron, it become a new species. In the end, it has a, pro, uh, a number five, uh, atomic number five. So that's boron, just as it was before, and it gives off the neutrino. Okay, here's another way we depict the data, the, the transition. For carbon-14, which is right here at the top, we, we transition from carbon to nitrogen, right? From carbon to nitrogen. Uh, and the energy difference is the same as the mass defect, 0.156 MeV. So that's the change in, in uh, uh, binding energy between the two. There is no isomeric transitions. There are no energy levels in the nitrogen to pass through to create secondary or additional radiation. Here's carbon-12, the example we gave here. Carbon-10, it's the beta plus decay. Carbon-12, because it's uh, it's moving to a, uh, it's beta plus, it's moving to a lower uh, uh, atomic number. So we designate that as moving to the left. The, uh, there are three levels that are possible. The ground state of, of, of boron 10, some of these can fall into uh, two different states and then undergo transition. We have our photons that accompany the beta particle. Okay, because it's possible because the, the, um, the dip change in energy level is greater than 1.1 MeV, 1.022 MeV to the Mass of two, the rest mass of two electrons. So the maximum beta energy is 2.93 MeV. Electron capture is also possible, in which case, if we add up these energies, the, L, the um, uh, mass is 3.64, the total equal to the total Q value. Uh, okay. Again, it can be accompanied by isomeric transitions uh, because. Daughter, uh, parent. Now, positron that's emitted, the beta plus particle. Uh, so, antimatter, when it combines with uh, the corresponding matter, undergoes decay, and two photons are created that are the uh, rest, each of the rest mass of the particles. So if a positron is emitted from a nucleus, it will thermalize, it will give up its energy by matters that will, by methods we'll talk about next time. And as it slows down, eventually it becomes close to an orbital electron. They absorb each other and give off photons. Uh, because it has no momentum to begin with, the photons have to be back to back identically. Um, uh, and so there's no momentum at the end. There's no momentum at the beginning because it slowed down. Uh, and um, the energy has to exactly match the, the rest masses of the two electrons. Uh, okay. um, it's possible to have three photon uh, positron annihilation at very high energies, but it requires a nucleus to absorb some of the momentum. Okay. Um, Here's an example of electron capture. Uh, Q value is one, only 1.001 MeV. So positron decay is not possible. So um, the, the uh, 
gallium nucleus, again, we're moving toward a lower atomic number. So the, the arrows are shown on the left, moves into zinc 67 from gallium 67. Um, are four different electron captures that are possible. They enter into three excited states and then they're going to go transition to the ground state. They give up a number of different photons with different energies. So a total of 10 gamma rays and they also emit six conversion electrons with that are um, uh, correspond to some of these gamma rays. Okay, so a, a conversion electron is very similar to OJ electrons that occur when the, there's a nuclear uh, transition. The gamma ray can impart its energy to an electron in the same way that the um, atomic transition <clears throat> imparted its energy to an electron for OJ effect. <clears throat> Another type of, of radiation that can be emitted that occurs at very high, with very heavy elements, high atomic mass, is alpha decay. Here's an example of radium-226 giving off an alpha particle. The mass number decreases by 4 from 226 to 222. The um, atomic number decreases by 2, two protons left from 88 to 86. Radium gives rise to radon. Okay, uh, The Q value, that is the, the change in, in energy. So there are two uh, proton, uh, alpha particles have two different uh, kinetic energies. One is the overall energy is 4.8 MeV. One alpha particle has an um, energy of 4.7 MeV. Another has an alpha particle of, of kinetic energy of, of 4.6 uh, MeV and different abundances. Now notice what happens if we move from a very heavy element out here to a lighter element, it's much more tightly bound. And that's what gives us the energy that can give us these high Q values. We don't have to create new particles because we're giving up the, the particles that existed. Whereas with the positron, we had to create a particle and a particle pair. So uh, why the alpha particles carry away a lot of energy and allow uh, movement to a much higher, tight, more tightly bound state. Um, another way that nuclei can decay is by spontaneous fission. This diagram doesn't show spontaneous fission, it shows uh, stimulated fission uh, by absorption of a neutron. But in some nuclei, they're so uh, unstable, California 252, that they can spontaneously divide and uh, move from loosely bound to a more tightly bound state by moving to, by becoming two intermediate energy or intermediate mass particles. We'll talk more about that later. Now, we've talked about the different kinds of decays that are possible. <clears throat> Let's talk about the kinetics, about, oh, about what's going on in the decay. <clears throat> the activity of decay, when we talk about radioactivity, the activity is the number of transformations that are undergone per unit time. In the SI units, the, the fundamental unit is the second, so one transformation per second has a special name of one Becquerel. Okay. Um, so the activity in the sample, the, that is the number of under, that undergo transformation per unit time, is proportional to the, to the number of unstable nuclei there. When there's a lot of carbon-14 present or unstable nuclei present, there are more transitions per unit time. When there's fewer uh, nuclei present, uh, then there's uh, fewer transitions in that same amount of time. So um, this is an example with cobalt-60, which has a half-life of about five and a quarter years. Um, and talk about half-lives in a minute. But we, the, the more material is present, the more uh, transformations undergo decay. Now, uh, let's talk about that. So if we have the number that undergo decay per unit time is equal to some constant times the number that are present. Now we have a negative sign because the number of transformations, the, the number that are, uh, the change is a decrease. So we're going from a larger number to a smaller number 
as they undergo decay. So that's why there's a minus sign. But the, the number that are changing is proportional to the number that are there. Solve this equation. That means that the number that are present at any unit time, at any time, is equal to the number that are present at the beginning. And then they fall off as mathematically as some exponential, e to the minus lambda t. Now, I said the activity is uh, uh, the number of transformations. So the number that change per time is lambda n. Is the number that change per unit time, which is lambda n. Uh, is that equal to, well, n is equal to n0 e to the minus lambda t. The activity is lambda n, lambda n0 e to the minus. The activity is minus lambda n. So if, the other thing is, if I look at 0, that's the amount that we're the activity at the initial stage. So the activity at any period of time is equal to the initial activity e to the, times e to the minus lambda t. It undergoes a, an exponential fall off. Okay. So this is a fundamental equation of radioactive decay and how it progresses through time. Okay. Um, another way of, so we've got this lambda that parametrizes the rate of decay. Another way of parametrizing the speed of decay is the half-life. The half-life is the amount of time that's required for half of the original sample to undergo decay. That's shown here. We go from 100 to 50 in a certain amount of time, 5.25 years. That's the half-life. Then that undergo, that half of what's remaining is a loss in 5.27 years. So half of what's there is gone in another 5.27. Now we're at 25%. Then we go another half-life and we're at uh, an eighth, 12 and a half percent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The amount that's present in each, for each half-life is, uh, is it, at the beginning, is cut in half during a half-life. So we know that the, I want to show you that the half-life, the value of the half-life is related to the K parameter. So we know that the activity is A of any given time is a, the initial activity E to the minus lambda T. So let's pick a time then we're going to call it T1 half. That's the half-life. We're going to pick a time when the activity is uh, divided by the initial activity is one half. So it's, it's undergone, half of it has disappeared. So if we put it into our formula, one half is equal to A over A0 is one half. So E to the minus lambda T1 half, one half is equal to E to the minus lambda half-life, T1 half. So I can solve this, take logarithm of both sides, and uh, the half-life is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by lambda, or 0.693 over lambda. Another thing, interesting note, the, a long half-life corresponds to a small lambda, and vice versa. A short half-life means that there's a large lambda. Okay. The mean life. So, as we have all these different atoms that are undergoing, uh, being emitted, less and less being emitted over time, if I look at all of them overall and find out what is the average amount of time they lasted before they underwent decay, that's the mean life. So I take the, the number that are transforming at any particular time times the length that they survived, and I add those all up and then integrate and divide that by the number of uh, atoms that went into the whole population. And I do this calculation. Uh, it's um, in the book, but I, uh, if you're interested, I can do it for you. Send me an email. Uh, then the mean life is actually equal to 1 over lambda. So the, the mean life is related to the decay parameter in this fashion. We know that the decay parameter is also related to the half-life. So the mean life, that uh, uh, average time an atom goes on before it decays, is 1.44 times the half-life. Okay. Now... Another thing we should talk about is uh, uh, calculating the decay of the, cur the current activity. Uh, so let's use an example to illustrate how this is done. So if we have a, sim a sample of P32 that has 37,000 Becquerel at the beginning at time equals zero, what is the activity 28 and a half days later? Well, things we what we need to know is what is the half-life of p32 so we go to one of our resources um, i think i've got one here 
Yeah, here we go. I go to our resource. This one's sponsored by the Health Physics Society. Um, and I pick phosphorus. Where is it? Uh, right here. And then I pick the element I'm interested in is phosphorus 32. I get the data. It's 14.26 days. So this is one of the reliable sources you can use to get decay data. Uh, so one point that's 14.26 days. So I looked it up. It's 14.26 days. What's the decay parameter for that? Well, it's ln 2.693 divided by lambda or lambda. Yeah, uh, that's T one half. In other words, if I reverse them, lambda is equal to 0.693 divided by the half life. So it's 0.693 divided by the half life. And if I do that calculation, it's 0.0486 days. Um, so if I use my equation, e to the minus lambda t, a is equal to a0, e to the minus lambda t, this is the initial activity, 37,000, e to the minus lambda, 0.046 per day, 0.0486 per day, 28.5 days later, that if I multiply those, now notice that the units cancel out in the exponent. This is per day and that's days. And so they cancel out and everything's good. If, the, if we use different units here, we will get an error. In the exponents, the units have to cancel out to be just a pure number. So then I end up with uh, 37,000 Becquerel times e to the minus point, uh, 1.385. If I put that in my calculator, I get 37,000 times 0.25 which is 9,250. Now, we have another way we can do this. So that's one way to calculate the current activity. Another is instead of using this to calculate the, uh, the half-life, uh, to using the half-life to calculate the decay parameter, you can use the half-life directory directly. And the formula for that is the initial activity times one half to the uh, um, length of time divided by half-lives. How many half-lives has it been? <clears throat> so we've waited 28 and a half uh, days. The half-life is 14.26 days. Notice the units once again cancel out in the exponent. So if, uh, this is uh, two half-lives. 0.5 to the, two, to the squared is a quarter. And I get 0.9250 uh, row, same as we did before. Notice that when... The, um, the time is equal to two half lives. E to the minus lambda t became a quarter, and a half squared it became a quarter as well. Okay. Another concept I need to get to quickly: specific activity is the activity per unit mass. When we calculate the specific activity, we only include the radioactive element, not any stable material that's associated with it. For example, if we're talking about tritiated water (HTO). We only consider the mass of the tritium. We ignore the mass of the hydrogen and the oxygen, the stable nuclei. The specific activity of element of a, of a, a nuclide is only the mass of the nuclide. Um, so uh, the activity uh, is equal to lambda times the number present. The number of present, well, let's look at N is the number of moles. Instead of the, the number of atoms, it's the number of moles times Avogadro numbers. Avogadro's number, that's equal to the number of uh, atoms present, right? So lambda n is equal to the activity. What's the mass? Well, it's the number of moles times the, the atomic mass, the, the gram atoms. You might have learned it about in chemistry. So A is the atomic uh, mass, uh, the, the grams per mole. So what's the specific activity? It's the activity divided by the mass. The activity is... Lambda times the number of moles times Avogadro number. The um, mass is uh, times the uh, atomic mass. And so the specific activity is lambda times Avogadro's number divided by the atomic mass. These are only properties of that element, the, the decay parameter and the atomic uh, mass. Okay, well, that covers what we uh, need to cover for our first video. Um, in, in the coming lecture, we're going to talk about the, the properties of different types.
types of radiation, all those photons and electrons and alpha particles we talked about, and then how these different types of matter, uh, types of radiation affect matter, how they interact, uh, affect matter, and how they affect people. I thank you for your attention. Uh, it's been longer than I like to make these, but we have a lot of information to cover. Hopefully it's just a review, so you have a great time uh, working on